film we hope to uncover Sylvia's work, put her vital contribution back on the map and pay homage to an extraordinary woman and revolutionary who refused to accept a second class position for women and for whom politics meant social transformation. I suppose that one problem in talking about my mother is that she was always involved in one struggle or another and she didn't reminisce very much. For her, her struggle was her life and it was not something to write about later unless it was relevant to the present. Unlike her mother, Emmeline, whose statue we see here, and sister Christabel, both of whom gave up on fighting for the vote in order to support the war effort, Sylvia was dead set against the war. She campaigned against it and supported the activities of the Bolsheviks in revolutionary Russia. She focused her attention on working class women, universal suffrage, and a broader tone to the system and social inequality. Perhaps that's why she's not here. Whether Sylvia would have wanted to have been remembered outside an institution that opposed everything she stood for is another matter, but there can be no doubt that she's worth remembering and learning from. I'm most touched that there is this idea to erect a statue in the memory of my mother. She, however, would be more happy, would be more interested in the success of her causes. Her monument lies also in her work, in a mass of um, things that she has written in, in support of the various ways in which she feels that the world should move. Sylvia Pankhurst was born in Manchester. From 1900 to 1902, she studied at Manchester Municipal School of Art, where she won several prizes, including a travelling scholarship, which enabled her to study mosaics in Florence and Venice. On her return in 1903, she was commissioned to decorate Pankhurst Hall in Salford, built by the ILP, the Independent Labour Party, in memory of her father. While decorating the hall, Sylvia learned that women were in fact not permitted to join that branch of the ILP, and that the building was to be for men only. We can only imagine how outraged Sylvia and her family must have been that Pankhurst Hall, decorated by a woman, built in honour of her father, a chief advocate of women's emancipation, would so unashamedly discriminate against women. It was in fact this incident that spurred Sylvia's mother, Emmeline, to establish a new women's organisation, the Women's Social and Political Union, or the WSPU. At this point, Sylvia was still the young artist. She gained a two-year scholarship to study at the RCA, the Royal College of Art in South Kensington from 1904 to 1906. Sylvia's artworks reflected her political conviction and gradually politics left her little time for artistic endeavour. As she wrote to her friend Kia Hardy, is it just that we should be permitted to devote our entire lives to the creation of beauty while others are meshed in monotonous drudgery? She was very much influenced by her father, Richard Pankhurst, a lawyer, who was a Republican a radical. He wanted the nationalisation of land, the abolition of the monarchy. He, in the late 19th century, was asking for many reforms which we've still not achieved. And I think that played a dominant role on, in her life. Within the collection, we have quite a few examples of uh, Sylvia Pankhurst's work. And of course, it was Sylvia who actually gave the Votes for Women campaign the visual identity that was so important as part of its success. And it was Sylvia who actually first produced the members card that was issued to those who joined the WSPU from 1906. And as you can see, her artistic work here is very much looking at the women in terms of strong working women holding aloft the Votes for Women banner. This did change in terms of the work that she produced for the Women's Social and Political Union over the years. It was called the Women's Social and Political Union, because in 1903, when it had been formed, it, it was um, really the Independent Labour Party, and it was formed in the north, in Manchester. But gradually, all that was dropped. In 1907, when the WSPU moved to London, they abolished the democratic constitution and they set up a, a very, very autocratic organisation. So a lot of good people were expelled and left. I'm not talking about Sylvia at this stage. It's amazing that Sylvia stayed in for another seven years. 
the Women's Freedom League was um, formed as a result of this because people didn't like the way the Pankhurst were running this thing. But they got what they wanted. What they got was a lot of very, very posh women, titled women, marching with the suffragette colours. And this is what actually has made a lot of very, very good press and pictures. It looks, it looks good, rather than raggedy working class women in clogs and shawls. You know, these nicely upright women who were wearing silks and satins, purple, white and green sashes, they looked smashing and they marched along to the suffrage anthem uh, composed by Edith Howe Martin. Don't ask me to sing it because I can't. <laughs> Parliamentary terms, you get the first ever petition from a woman in uh, 1832 during the progress of the Great Reform Act mm -hmm. saying that she paid taxes and mm -hmm. she had to obey the same laws and was subject to the same rules as everybody else, therefore why couldn't she have the vote? Mm -hmm. um, various groups of women um, worked very hard to lobby Parliament, to present petitions and so on. They had some very powerful supporters within Parliament, uh, of whom Mr John Stuart Mill was the most famous. But basically they didn't get anywhere. By the end of the century, they hadn't managed to progress, and that's when you get suffragettes. Some groups of women who were fed up of these peaceful campaigning, of these petitions that they kept producing that didn't seem to get anywhere, and um, you get women who wanted to use more militant means to try and get their end. Mm -hmm. And on Thursday, I was called up very early in the morning to come down and watch the pier fall into the sea. The suffragettes had put a bomb in the dressing room and the place was totally destroyed. When was the first militancy directed towards Parliament? Was this... Uh, um, 1906, 1906 is the first record we have uh, in the parliamentary records here. Um, when um, Keir Hardy had a motion in Parliament in April 1906. I understand this was talked out. Basically, uh, MPs who are opposing whatever is happening at the moment will just take it in terms to stand up and talk at length about the subject and maybe veering off very widely until we get to the end of the time slot allocated for discussion of this and therefore it goes nowhere. What surprised me, I think it was all Black Friday, where a lot of the banners were asking for parliamentary time and they were appealing to the government for right. parliamentary time, so they were quite conscious that yes. you know, the amount of time given by the government was a sort of big deal. I think the, the Liberal government had an awful lot to do. Women's suffrage just was not high up enough its agenda mm -hmm. for what the women wanted. Mm -hmm. And parliamentary time is very precious and tight even today. Militancy had forced the issue into public debate. And in 1910, a bill was introduced to give richer women the parliamentary vote. The bill was shelved. Suffragettes almost immediately resumed their tactics of pressure through militancy. But the police had orders to delay arrests. Wave after wave of women, some of whom carried placards, were punched, knocked down and trampled on. My mother, like other members of her family, and like the suffragettes in general, was very much committed to the idea of women's enfranchisement at the parliamentary level. But she never felt that that was the end, that was only a means to the end. And she regarded parliament as a first step that you should get women in Parliament and give them the women the right to vote as part of the general emancipation of women and indeed of the working class that was without a vote for most of that time. However, she was never over-enthusiastic about Parliament. She saw the failures of Parliament, as we have seen in the time after her death. On one of the occasions where she took a little break from the campaigning, she went off to do some painting of working women. They're lovely paintings, actually. I mean, she was a good artist, you know. I mean, very good. Her paintings are not without a political message. If one takes the work which she did on her tour of Northern England at that time, her paintings reveal the situation, the inequality of employment, the absence of any idea of equal pay, and at the same time her paintings show that she's criticising it, that she's drawing attention to the, the, the viewer who looks at her paintings. <laughs> 
as she draws attention to the person who reads her writings, that this is an unequal situation. I think the very fact that she chose to tour uh, areas showing women at work, uh, this idea itself was novel, I think, in the art world, so to speak. I don't think there were many artists who uh, were interested or took trouble to see women working in painting. And uh, you see a sort of a, an older woman cleaning fish, and you see her arms thick from years and years of hard labour. And so I, I think that these paintings really said, look how women are treated, that they can't live a proper life, that they're sort of stunted existence and get old before their time. And so I think that it's important that the paintings, again, were totally subordinated to the message, the political message, and, and it was something quite new. What were Sylvia and women like her, her fellow campaigners, up against? Women were thought to be totally inferior to men in every way. Um, it was thought that they had smaller brains, <laughs> that um, they had no rights to education other than a few women who managed to break through, and that they had no right to own their own property up until 1888. There were very, very limited rights um, at all. And for working class women, it was much, much worse. And that kind of ideology, you know, that ideology of oppression, permeated even the socialist movement and the labour movement. The Social Democratic Federation, which was supposedly a Marxist organisation, a man called um, Belfort Bax, who was supposed to be a Marxist, and his line was that women should certainly not have equal rights because they, they, they couldn't exercise those rights. They were too stupid. They were, they were still half children, they had not emerged. Uh, in fact, a famous phrase that he used was, um, men have sex, women are sex. <laughs> Which sums it up, doesn't it? And he also thought that anything that was given to women in terms of equal rights took away from men. So in other words, he saw a competition between the sexes. Most trade unions oppose women's suffrage as well, if they thought about it. The only organisation that didn't um, was the Independent Labour Party, and that was largely due to the work of um, James Keir Hardy, who really was very much on the side of women. But I would say that it was hardly surprising, given the predominant ideology of Victorian and later Edwardian society, which was just virulently anti-women. Women were very much seen as having a purely sort of domestic role in life. They were not, it was not really acceptable for them to take a very strong public role and particularly not one that brought them out onto the streets in militant and direct action. Well, why is this such a problem? Why not give rights for women? But the problem is, is that capitalism inherits the subordination of women. A natural division of labour, some would argue, based on human attributes, but becomes irrelevant under capitalism when you have machine production. Because why would people be subordinate? They can do exactly the same things. And at the same time, if you have somebody in a family, and most of us still want to live in families, who becomes responsible for domestic work, you don't have to pay them. So the construction of the family, which capitalism had inherited, is quite useful because you don't have to pay people to reproduce themselves. And so this is good. So perpetuating the ideological subordination of women and having that as an economic basis for society becomes something which is very difficult to get rid of. So what about these postcards? Because this is the anti-suffrage propaganda, isn't it? And I've just been looking through some of them and they're actually quite humorous. These postcards were produced by commercial postcard makers, manufacturers. It's an absolute testament to how much the suffrage movement was in the popular consciousness. So thousands upon thousands of these would have been printed and distributed. But this is the commercial wing and not an organised anti-suffrage movement. But there was an organised anti-suffrage movement as well, supported by women and men. 
who put forward those arguments about why women shouldn't be having the vote, and it's certainly part of the debate at that time. These two images here represent suffragettes as cats and the sort of whiny, meowing sort of suffragette, I want my vote, was a very common way of portraying the suffragettes. Another way of portraying the suffragettes was as these sort of small women overawed by the large policeman here or the judge here. Of course, the reality was very different from this because the suffragettes were very much holding their own, particularly when they went to court or um, in their relations with the police. Another way of portraying suffragettes was to see them as unwomanly. She's wearing quite a mannish jacket and what was referred to as a pork pie hat. And pork pie hats at the time were very much associated with lesbianism. The suffragettes themselves also experienced hate mail. Here, someone has handwritten on the front a striking example of a suffragette's home, if they have any homes. Again, reference to the fact that many believed that by going out on the streets and campaigning, the suffragettes were really neglecting their traditional roles of wife and mother. On the back of this, someone has written, you set of sickening fools, if you have no homes, no husbands, no children, no relations, why don't you drown yourselves out of the way? Why was the, the state so hostile to this demand for women to have the vote and for universal suffrage? Well, I expect you'll have heard that um, what's become a, a proverb, if voting counted for anything, they'd abolish it. The point is that at this time it really did count for something. It really was how those who were recognised as British capitalists or the kind of people that British capitalists felt that they could do business with, that relatively restricted minority, it was how they did business am among themselves. And unsurprisingly, they were very coy, <laughs> uh, very defensive about who they would allow to have this privileged voice about the destiny of their country because let's face it it did belong to uh, the British capitalists the working class owned none of it so when did the police report start then um, the police report starts pretty much in 1906. Mm -hmm. They're written by the policeman in charge to the sergeant at arms. The sergeant at arms is the official still in charge of ceremony and security in the House of Commons. Does Sylvia Pankhurst feature in some of these police reports? She certainly does, yes. There are quite a number of uh, reports where she, she appears quite a few times doing things like throwing stones and generally causing trouble. And um, there was a blacklist of um, the women who particularly caused problems and even after the war she was still on this because you can see here's a note from 1919 with her name there Miss Estelle Sylvia Pankhurst um, and she's one of several women who are not to be admitted in future within the precincts of the House of Commons um, so she carried on um, with her campaigns even after um, some women had got the vote in 1918. So some of these are actually during the First World War? Sylvia Pankhurst who had been discharged from Holloway Prison that date, came to St Stephen's entrance in a private motor car. She um, stopped and remained in the centre of the roadway until 10.15pm. So when did women began getting sent to prison then? Well, they were sent to prison, I think, at the beginning, but it was hunger striking that was the real, that made the real difference there. But obviously they couldn't just release every woman that went on hunger strike um, because um, then, any, then every single woman that went to prison would have simply done that, so they had to find another method of dealing with it, and that was force feeding. This is Holloway Prison today. Although it was completely rebuilt in 1970, as we can see, it still looks pretty grim. From 1903 to this day, it remains a prison for women. Sylvia Pankhurst was only 24 years old when she was packed off to prison for the first time on October 24, 1906. The suffragettes had been demonstrating outside the House of Commons the previous day and 10 of them, including Sylvia's younger sister Adela Pankhurst, were arrested. In court, they protested at not being able to speak and make a statement in their own defence, so the magistrate called the police and had them bundled off to prison over here. <laughs> 
Sylvia was so outraged by this that she ran into the court in order to complain to the magistrate, at which point she was promptly thrown out onto the streets where she tried to address a crowd. She was quickly grabbed by policemen and charged with obstruction and abusive language. She was then fined either one pound or undergo imprisonment over here for a fortnight. Of course, refusing to pay, she was then driven off in a black van to this place over here. That was the first of many periods in prison for Sylvia. Over a thousand suffragettes went to prison during the fight for the right to vote, and Sylvia was in prison more than most. Sylvia Pankhurst designed these scrolls from 1908, and uh, they were presented to all women on their release from imprisonment. And if we look at the artwork here, you can see that it's quite different from the earlier members' card that Sylvia produced for the campaign. Now, by 1908, she's introducing images uh, such as trumpeting angels, and this became a recurring logo and image that she would use on a lot of suffragette material. And so a much more sort of feminine, almost sort of spiritual type of image, moving away from the sort of working women with the strong arms and uh, wearing the clogs and the working clothes. And this was really much more of the um, image that the Women's Social and Political Union tried to, to present to the world. Here we have actually a photograph of one of the breakfast receptions that were held to present such items to the released prisoners. And here in this one, which was held in 1908 to uh, celebrate the release of Mrs Tanner, we have an image of Elsa Guy and also Sylvia Pankhurst. They were on the, the main table, the leader's table, presenting the scroll or a badge to Mrs Tanner. From the summer of 1909, direct confrontation between the state and the suffragettes, which was already quite brutal, intensified. In July 1909, the suffragettes began to hunger strike in order to expose the horrific nature of their imprisonment. The government responded with their own chilling new tactic of force feeding. Surveillance of the suffragettes was stepped up right across the country by special branch officers who were to report on leading campaigners and keep a close eye and monitor their activities. Sylvia was obviously being watched, and the secret file held on her, now open to public scrutiny, shows that her speeches were being recorded, police tactics for arresting her were being plotted, and both the police officers as well as the prison guards were to report on her activities daily to the Home Office. I beg to report that I, Inspectors McNamara and Sandercock, and other officers, kept observation in the vicinity of Shoreditch Town Hall last evening for the purpose of arresting Sylvia Pankhurst. Of course, she was many times imprisoned for her suffragette activity, her support of the movement, and it's ironic that Britain at that time had the so-called Liberal government, a Liberal government which put women in prison and applied forcible feeding to them, for thrusting a tube down their throats. Scarcely liberalism as we imagine it. Force feeding became a matter of course here at Holloway Prison. It caused severe damage and long-term ill health. It was widely condemned by many of the medical journals and the press at the time. However, it was continued all the way until 1914. It's difficult to know what we might be willing to go to prison for today. But for Sylvia and the suffragettes, who endured the horrors of a place like this, it was about not giving in to state-enforced inequality. The effects of the hunger strikes remained with her all her life. She had to be very, very careful what she had. She carried out many hunger, th hunger strikes, but added to them the thirst strike. And what she thought was the most effective was the strike against sitting down. So she would walk, walk until she collapsed because the objective of the women's suffrage at that time was to destroy their health so as to be released, so as to go out, so as to agitate again. And was there any discussion within Parliament about force feeding? Oh yes, yes. Um, the Hansard debate shows some MPs were absolutely you know, dis disgusted, sort of morally wrong, and the sort of foremost MPs for that were the Labour MPs, Keir Hardy, the Labour leader, and uh, George Lansbury, basically accusing the government of, of uh, torture. And uh, because of the outcry over that, they needed another way of dealing with the women who were being force-fed. And uh, this was the result. This is what's known as the Cat and Mouse Act, but its full title, as you can see here, is the Prisoners' Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act of 1913. 
basically this allowed the authorities to release a prisoner who was in poor health, i.e. a woman who'd been hunger striking, force fed and was very weak, until she regained her health and then they would simply re-arrest her to continue the sentence. And it was known as the Cat and Mouse Act because it was seen as a, like a cat playing with a mouse, letting it go only to catch it again and bring it back in. And so the government being the cat and the suffragette the mouse. The suffragettes sort of uh, did all sorts of things to try and escape. Once they were released from prison, they would sort of go into hiding and go into safe houses and so on. I have to forward herewith, for the information of the Secretary of State, a copy of the police report regarding the re-arrest of Miss Sylvia Pankhurst at the Town Hall, Poplar on the 14th instant, for failing to comply with the order of her temporary discharge under the Prisoner's Temporary Discharge for All Health Act 1913. She had spent a number of years very active in the Women's Social and Political Union, being imprisoned, on the hunger strike. But I think there came a point where she began to feel a certain amount of disillusion with the trajectory of the WSPU. And she was very keen to retain her roots and her commitment to a socialist movement and to the labour movement more generally. So she moved to the east of London and founded the East London Federation of the Suffragettes, which was still affiliated with the WSPU at the time. And there, it's often depicted as her moving into the abyss. East London was a particularly poor part of, well, the country. But she thought that that's where the campaign should be, that you needed the support of working class women to move the campaign forward. In most people's imagination, Sylvia Pankhurst is most associated with the women's suffrage movement, and that's fine. But what people already forget is that she was associated with the struggles of working class women in the East End of London. And for her, the struggle for the working class as a whole and the struggle for women's rights were always inseparable. And she was right on every single count, because what she knew and understood was that even in the workplace, Fighting for women's rights, the right for equal pay, for example, was good for both men and women because it made it impossible for the employer to divide men and women inside the workplace. But it wasn't just a workplace issue. She thought and she understood that the defence of the democratic rights of women, and they're only conceivable under capitalism, that's, it's a difficult point to grasp. People say, well, you know, women have been subordinated throughout history, which is true. But the difference was, as soon as you have the idea of equality, which is given by the idea of everybody having rights as citizens, then the idea of inequality becomes real. And so the struggle to get rights for women is a struggle for democracy, as well as a struggle to change society. And that's the fundamental gain of the idea of introducing the struggle against oppression into the struggle against capitalism. And that's what she was good at. The crucial coordination of the idea of the working class movement fighting for democratic rights and being the only one that could do that consistently, uh, she's on, in that sense, if I use the phrase, and you'll excuse me, on the side of the angels. What was going on economically in the East End at the time? What were people doing in the East End? Well, the thing is, the main drive of the economy wasn't really happening in the East End. Yes, there were factories in East London. The powerhouse of the economy was in Manchester and Birmingham. And the portal, literally, was London through the docks. And the primary role of the London working class was to move the stuff around. was a, a terrible, terrible area. I mean, really terrible area. This was a, just slum tenements with rack-renting landlords, which went on and on and on. Women worked in the sweated trades. In fact, the East London Federation organised a, a sweated trades ex exhibition in the East End, showing that the terrible works, you know, when I say sweated trades, this was women working in sweatshops, in, disgusting sort of work, unventilated workshops in their own homes and that was typical East End employment. People worked in horrible conditions. These were what's known as uh, Charles Booth 
survey poverty maps. Charles Booth was a ship owner from Liverpool and he'd read a lot in the socialist pamphlets etc about poverty being widespread, particularly in the East End. He wanted to try and really to prove that it wasn't as widespread as people were saying. And what they did was basically coloured in the maps depending on what class of people lived in the different streets and prepared a guide. So you can see here we have, if the road was coloured in black, you have the lowest class, vicious semi-criminal right through to the gold colour, almost naturally, which was the upper middle class and upper classes. Oh, here we are, so with the London docks here. What he actually proved was that a lot of people thought that the whole of the East End would be black. Mm -hmm. You know, the East End was, had, had earned this reputation as this sort of unknown territory never to go into. But what it actually proved was that poverty was actually dispersed quite widely, right amongst people who were less poor. Very much this, at the time, this difference between the respectable working classes who went to work and lower class, vicious semi-criminal that were quite feared. And the East End, it was a predominantly working class area. That's why it was talked about as a place of danger and you know, where people feared to go. Yes, it was, it was where the working class lived. I mean, from the point of view of the British establishment, the danger was not really at the interpersonal level of will I get robbed if I go down there, although that's the way many of the middle classes in particular might have talked about it. It, it was to do with whether or not the working class of London, and for that matter of the rest of Britain, could be successfully stabilised, integrated and incorporated into this dynamic, explosive, contradictory system so that was their major problem. That political dynamism was, really was connected to the role that the East End of London was playing as the portal for British capitalism and, and British empire. The idea of East London as a portal shouldn't be just restricted to the movement of goods. It involved the movement of different groups of people and different ideas and in particular uh, political ideas for liberation and emancipation of those very people who were being trucked around the British Empire almost as if they were themselves capitalist commodities. When Sylvia split from the WSPU and set up the ELFS, a lot of people have said that this was the result of her disagreement with the militant tactics of the WSPU. To me, that seems to have completely missed the point about her desire to create a mass movement, to, to build something. What do you think about that argument? Oh, I, th I think it's complete nonsense. I mean, the reason why she was expelled was because she didn't obey her mother and her sister. She was summoned to Paris to see Christabel, who was nursing a, pom a Pomeranian dog at the time, and said, we can brook no divided loyalty to us. You know, we are an army, and if you want to do your own thing, you've got to form your own organisation. And the issue of militant tactics was not an issue at all because Sylvia had been in prison and had been forcibly fed many, many, many times. She wasn't scared of that, but she did not think the vote would be won um, just by the heroism of the few. She thought it could only be won by creating a mass movement of the many, which is, by the way, why she chose the East End, because it was the, an area which was close to Parliament, which she can take deputations to, and the government, of course, could no longer smear the whole notion of women's suffrage as a ladies' bill. When he saw these women coming, and by the way, in 1914, Asquith did receive a deputation of women from the East End, and these were activist women. But the most important thing about this deputation was that it occurred only because Sylvia threatened um, an indefinite hunger and thirst strike until Asquith received this deputation. And he did eventually receive this deputation, which is pretty amazing actually. So I don't think, I don't think it would be right to say that um, Sylvia didn't ever want to involve herself in militant tactics. What she thought was 
it was misguided not to build a mass movement. My mother's involvement in the suffragette movement and that of the family as a whole was such that you had various splits in the suffragette movement as you have in other progressive movements very often. What is unusual about this, this particular split is that it was a split within a family rather than a split between certain separate individuals. And for that reason it became a very, very deeply felt split. And some years ago, after her death, I found the letters which Christabel had sent to her, this correspondence. What these letters show is that though the two sisters exchanged a few letters on matters of general interest, it was not in any way a meeting of minds. You have on the one hand Christabel who wanted to work essentially with the upper classes and to have a, an elite force of suffragette, suffragettes. And my mother, Sylvia, who was much more interested in a democratic movement which would embrace men as well as women and would be a classless parliamentary movement. So that Sylvia saw the suffragette movement as a continuation of other struggles in the past like the Chartist movement, which was demanding universal adult suffrage, whereas Christabel was more concerned with a limited suffrage. It's relatively easy, it's pretty straightforward to accept that relatively well-off women should be part of the polity. Sylvia's real contribution is the idea that the struggle for women's rights is part of a struggle, a broader struggle for democracy, a broader struggle for social emancipation in which women who happen to be members of a ruling elite will have more in common with their menfolk than they would in struggling for the rights of ordinary women just as they would be disdainful of the rights of ordinary dockers. And so the struggle for women's rights, the idea that this is part of a struggle for so social emancipation becomes part and parcel of a broader programme. Now, in your book, you talk about Sylvia's impact is a little bit underestimated and that perhaps she was even more important in her campaigning for women's rights than her mother and her sister, Emmeline and Christabel. What led you to that conclusion? I think it's undoubtedly the case that she was much more important than them. Sylvia was different from her mother and sister. She continued the campaign for the vote after 1914 when her mother and her sister completely ditched it in favour of the war effort. And not only did they do that, um, also the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies also did. In fact, the East London Federation of Suffragettes was just about the only organisation still fighting for the vote. That's firstly. Secondly, I, I regard her as more important because what she did was attempt to build a mass organisation of working class women in favour of the vote and in favour of so socialism in the East End of London. And that was a unique contribution to, to bridge the separate spheres, if you like, as I put it in the book, of the women's movement and the labour movement. And that makes her very, very important and actually probably more important than most male labour movement leaders in their day because she was involved in so many other issues. In fact, that's why she got expelled uh, from the Women's Social and Political Union, because she dared to be a socialist. And George Dangerfield, who was um, a liberal historian, said that in 1914, the most amazing thing occurred, and that was three movements coincided. Socialism, and that, by that he included the trade union movement, the Irish struggle for independence, which was very, very important, and the women's movement. Those three movements were all linked and Sylvia was part of all of them. She was dangerous. I mean, what a dangerous concoction that was to have the class and gender issue. It was much simpler if you could just pick off 
you know, isolated militant suffragettes, put them in prison. But if you had a huge movement developing, which was allying itself to the labour movement, as, for example, the massive um, meeting in the Albert Hall, organised by the Herald Leagues um, in 1914 to free um, James Larkin, where Sylvia spoke. By the way, that was the occasion on which she was, um, uh, Christabel decided to expel her. Because by that time, the Women's Social and Political Union said you could take up no other issue other than votes for women. So who wasn't prepared to do that? I mean, how could you just be so narrow as just say it's all about the vote and nothing else? When the whole of Britain was, you know, building up in flames, really. Now, once Sylvia had set up the East London Federation, a lot of the work she embarked on was setting up nurseries, toy factories, cost-priced restaurants, things like that. Um, you know, a lot of people have remarked that this was her charity work and was inconsistent with her political aspirations. What do you think about that? I think it was um, very sensible. This was She was doing this during the war, don't forget. And I think you have to put this in the context of the East End at the time, which was the most deprived area of the country. Well, that and parts of Glasgow. And the men were at the front, the women were left with nothing. As a result, there had to be some form of employment. She did lead, lead deputations to Parliament to get equal pay for women who are working in munitions factories. But the, all the other stuff that you've mentioned, I think was a clever way of trying to build a political movement. I don't think she did it, you know, with the aim of foxing people or just you know, making people think that she was just a more wonderful than she was. I don't accept the argument that she was, this was charity work. It wasn't. This was work which genuinely had the interest of working class women at, at the forefront. And as a result, many, many more women joined the East London Federation and became ultimately involved in anti-war work and suffrage work. The only thing was that she couldn't really, even though people knew that she was anti-war, she couldn't preach the anti-war line at that stage because almost everybody that came to use the facilities had a male relative at the front. It was only later when the full horrors of the war became clear the, an anti-war movement began to develop almost spontaneously. It wasn't until 1916, by the way, that conscription was introduced. And then, later on, you know, you got the horrors of the, the Somme, Passchendaele, all of these complete stupid war. It was an imperialist war. And she was able to articulate that, and people understood it. I think that was very important, but at the same time she was doing stuff to help. And you can still see where the Mother's Arms is on Old Ford Road. It was here in the Old Ford Road that Sylvia Pankhurst established her breakaway organisation, the East London Federation of Suffragettes. I'm standing where the headquarters once stood, here on 400 Old Ford Road. There's nothing left of the building today, but on the side of the Lord Morpeth pub here, there is a blue plaque which tells us that it was home to Sylvia Pankhurst and Nora Smith from 1914 to 1924, a women's hall and a cost price communal restaurant which they set up to provide local women with an affordable meal. This was very different from the sort of do-gooding kind of little bits and pieces that some women's organisations did, you know, going around making jam and, you know, just sort of being there for... I mean, she lived there, you know, they all lived there. Hidden away just behind the scaffolding here, you can make out a blue plaque which tells us that this was once the site of the Gunmakers Arms, a next public house which Sylvia obtained in 1915, set up as a nursery and renamed the Mother's Arms. On the opposite side of the road over there, you've got Gunmakers Lane because this used to be the site of a munitions factory. Interestingly enough, a local pub landlord just a few doors down believes that it was his pub, the Eleanor Arms, which was the Mother's Arms, and it sounds like he might be right.
when we took over the pub, I was interested in finding out originally who Eleanor was because nobody could tell us. And then as I went through the history, I discovered that the suffragette movement had taken over the pub in 1914 and used it as a creche. So I discovered a plaque on Tate Court saying that it was the site of the gunmaker's arms, which had been the mother's arms. Okay. And I thought, well, that's a bit strange because our pub was where the suffragettes used, um, had the creche. And I traced it back so I found out the name of the very first landlord in 1879 and subsequent people that run the pub. What makes you think that the day nursery was actually here as opposed to a few doors down? Well, as well as it being on Shepherd Neem's deeds to the property, I was given a picture postcard dated 1914 um, of a view taken from Gunmakers Lane onto Old Ford Road. And in that picture, there was green grass where the plaque is that says this is the site of the gunmaker's arms. And I thought, well, where is the gunmaker's arms that they all talk about? It's not there. There may have been two crashes, but there was definitely one which was here. Right. How did the suffragettes come to use this pub as their day nursery? I mean, it's know? because just further along the road was their headquarters, right. now demolished. Mm -hmm. They were obviously living on Old Ford Road mm -hmm. and in the vicinity. And so it'd be a natural choice because at that time there was pubs all over the place and they would have been underused because of the war. Right. Infant mortality was really high back in that, the east end of London. Mm -hmm. um, the, the conditions people lived in were, were squalor and they say that's why Queen Victoria gifted the park, right. which second biggest park in London is just behind those buildings, um, because of the conditions people were living in. I'm here in Victoria Park, which runs along the side of the Old Ford Road in Bow in East London. It's a seriously expensive area to live in now, but in Sylvia's day, it was one of the poorest parts of London. The park was opened in 1848 as it was thought it may be good for the health of the poor and it would keep the riffraff out of West London's parks. The East London Federation of Suffragettes held regular meetings and events here and they sold their paper, The Women's Dreadnought, later renamed The Workers' Dreadnought, at huge gatherings here in the park. One well-noted incident took place here on 24th of May 1914. A Women's May Day rally had been planned. Sylvia Pankhurst was escorted to the park by 20 women who had chained themselves to her to prevent her from being re-arrested as she still had three months jail sentence to complete. On reaching the park, the women were set upon by police who smashed their padlocks, beat and bruised the women, arrested Sylvia and sent her back to Holloway Prison. It may seem remarkable, but the violence the suffragettes suffered at the hands of the police never deterred them. In fact, to deal with police brutality, Sylvia Pankhurst imitated James Connolly's Irish Citizens Army and she set up a People's Army in August 1913. In her book, The Suffragette Movement, she explains it was an organisation men and women may join in order to fight for freedom and in order that they may fit themselves to cope with the brutality of government servants. The army drilled every Wednesday night after the Federation's meetings in Bow, and at its peak it was estimated that over a thousand women took part. Reports in the Dreadnought suggest that this was pretty effective and essential to deal with the police who regularly attacked and tried to break up demonstrations and meetings that were organised by the East London Federation. The spirit of the age was violent and tempestuous, not only because of the struggle between peers and commons. There were the suffragettes. And in industry, there was a wave of strikes and lockouts and great bitterness between employers and employed. Here what we've got is a letter written and signed by Sylvia Pankhurst, but on letterhead of paper which says the Workers' Suffrage Federation. So it went from the East London Federation, I believe it led on to this during the First World War. And, and their tagline here is, human suffrage, a vote for every woman and man of full age. I suppose it made a lot of sense to have that as your demand because obviously at that time not even every man was eligible to vote, I believe, and especially in places like the East End. Um, there was a property clause associated with voting. So many, certainly working class men, didn't have the franchise. And I think that must have caused a real tension, particularly for Sylvia in the mm -hmm. movement because her trajectory was towards a kind of working class politics. And how do you get working class women to join a campaign 
for a vote that you're not going to actually get if they succeed. And you really see that shift and her taking on a campaign for human suffrage, for an adult suffrage that includes men and women during this period. And that is certainly reflected in the change of name of the Federation. With the Workers' Suffrage Federation, I think it's right in saying that it was one of the few organisations that still had women in its leadership, and you can see some of that. You have Sylvia Pankhurst and Nora Smythe there on the letterhead as its financial secretary and its secretary, because a lot of labour movement people were in opposition to votes for women. This is the original Act of Parliament that uh, gave all adult men and some women the vote. Now, it dealt with an awful lot of other stuff apart from women, hence the size of it. Because the impetus for this act was not women at all, it was the need to expand the franchise because of the soldiers and sailors who would not have been able to vote when they came back at the end of the war. And that was, you know, quite rightly, seen as not, uh, not good enough. It's not quite as simple as saying um, women supported the war and therefore they got given the vote as a reward, but nevertheless, it, certainly uh, the Pankhursts were very much in favour of the war effort. Not Sylvia, I should say, but her mother and sister, Emily and Christabel, certainly threw themselves into the war effort. Women more generally had worked very hard through the war, taken on all sorts of jobs in munitions factories and in fields and in all sorts of areas of industry. And basically a lot of the old arguments just went away. You know, the women weren't capable of doing X and Y and Z because they'd done it, they'd proved they could do it during the war. And uh, therefore they were worthy of the vote. But not quite on the same terms as men. Mm -hmm. The age thing is quite interesting. It was a very blunt instrument, the age limit, to stop women being the majority of voters. It's one thing to give women the vote, but it was quite another thing to suddenly make them more than 50% of the electorate. And they would have been if they got the vote the same age as men because so many men had been killed in the war. Various people sat down, they did the calculations, and they figured that cutting off age 30 would give a sort of more acceptable balance, if you like. In many ways, it, was, it made no sense whatsoever because it was the younger women who had uh, actually gone into the munitions factories and the fields and so on and so forth, and they were the very ones that weren't being rewarded, as it were, by the vote. It had always been argued they would be incapable. Yet, despite fierce opposition from male trade unionists, they proved their capability in all kinds of jobs. There was a sort of powerful feeling that um, young women were sort of flighty and not to be trusted. Uh, later on in the 20s, you get the, the flapper argument that you can't give flappers the vote, whereas your women over 30 are sort of more likely to be sensible and vote sensibly and that sort of thing. A lot of people have said that women won the right to vote eventually as a result of their efforts during the war, during the First World War. What do you think about that argument? I think it's absolute nonsense. If that was true, and if it was true that it was women factory workers and all the rest of it, then why was it just women over 30 with a small property qualification who got the vote in 1918? Those women didn't get the vote, the, the ones I'm talking about, the ones who worked in armaments factories. But also, we know that the progress that had been made up until then with, you know, Asquith promising this adult suffrage bill, although reneging on it, was due to the, the consistent campaigning of organisations like Sylvia throughout the war. So I don't accept that argument at all. It, it was a class-based franchise still in 1918, not a reward for war work. So what was the role of the Workers' Dreadnought in all of this? Well, the Workers' Dreadnought by this time was a very influential paper. It had a circulation of around 10,000, which was quite large. And that was in the, all of East London, and it did actually get out to other places. It carried articles by revolutionaries up and down the country. People like Gallagher, um, who led the... Clyde Workers Committee wrote articles for the Dreadnought. So if you ever read the Dreadnought, this, this period, you know, from 1916 to 18, it's very, very exciting. You just think, oh, God, things are really happening. Also, to show you how influential it was, one of the most famous First World War poets, a man called Siegfried Sassoon, who was a major and had won the Military Cross, decided that he'd had enough of the stupid war. 
And he wrote to the Dreadnought. And it was interesting that he chose the Dreadnought to make his, what was called a soldier's declaration, chucked his military cross away and said, oh, this war's mad, this war's stupid, I've had enough of it. They didn't want to court-martial him because he was a major, well, scandal, and from a very, very rich family. But they sent him to, um, well, I suppose it was kind of a lunatic asylum, really, in Scotland called Craig Lockhart. The point is that he wrote to the Dreadnought. This was the paper of note. Anybody who was a radical socialist, a revolutionary, would write to use, read the Dreadnoughts because was an important paper and edited by a woman. How many women ever edited papers? Well, none as far as I know. As she had edited suffragette journals in the past and she was therefore governed by the discipline of having to produce the paper on time and that meant very often she would work all night until she had her breakfast and I went to school after which the copy was posted to the printer. At the end of the war, Sylvia's headquarters here on Old Ford Road served as the People's Russian Information Bureau, a very important centre for supporting the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. In fact, in 1917, Sylvia wrote, Our eager hopes are for the speedy success of the Bolsheviks of Russia. May they open the door which leads to freedom for the people of all lands. Reaction to the Bolshevik Revolution may surprise people today because it was incredibly positive. Let me put it very graphically because Winston Churchill, on hearing about the Bolshevik Revolution and wanting to intervene against it, said that it should be strangled in its cradle. And the British working class said, no, let's give it a chance. So what Sylvia Pankos was doing was keying in consciously to an aspiration of broader sections of people. It was at this time that the Third International was set up. So Lenin's first decree was to get out of the war, it was on peace, bread and land, and what were the British doing, still fighting this stupid war? That led to mutinies in Germany, there was a revolution. Hungary, there was a revolution. So a lot going on, and the Dreadnought reported it all. By 1918, the East London Federation of Suffragettes had evolved a stage further from the Workers' Suffrage Federation to become the Workers' Socialist Federation. It was the first political organisation in Britain to affiliate to the Third International. Sylvia, in effect, established Britain's first Communist Party. In October 1920, she was arrested and charged under the Defence of the Realm Act for publishing two articles urging the armed forces to mutiny. She was imprisoned in Holloway for the last time for six months and finally freed in May 1921. It may seem strange to, uh, to found a, a new political party, or well, it might seem strange today, and it would be strange if you were founding a political party in the way that people might do it today as a sort of joke or a sort of um, uh, attempt to define themselves. But that's not why political parties were formed in the past, and there were lots of them. They were attempts to really clarify the way you understood the world. Uh, and in certain senses, the party that people joined, and people around here, on that side of the river, on this side of the river, many of them would have been in political parties, and some of them would have joined Sylvia's party, some of them would have joined the Communist Party of Great Britain, many others would have been in the Labour Party or the Independent Labour Party. And programmatically, there would have been quite little differences which often leads to the accusation of sectarianism. But the other way of looking at it is, is that most people in this area wanted to change things and they thought it was conceivable to do it through political action. So what, that's the most important thing. The fact that they were in different political parties led to a lot of practical difficulties, but they could be resolved through struggle. And that was the whole idea about, you formed your political party you defined yourself and you went out to win arguments 
with people who you assumed could understand what you were talking about. I think in 1917, when the Labour Party supported the, the age limit, and then in 1924, when you had the first Labour government, they, I think their manifesto included women's equal rights, yeah. but they didn't pass a bill to give women... They tried, but um, they were operating under very difficult circumstances because they were a minority government. They, were, they could have been brought down at any moment by the other parties combined. It was not a bill that could be rushed through. It wasn't a bill that you could sort of apply any sort of emergency thing to and say, right, we need to get this. And the Conservatives were willing to use the House of Lords to stop it. And that's really the killer, because if the Conservatives are willing to use House of Lords to stop it, then you couldn't introduce it in unless you had a good three-year parliament. The Bolsheviks had a lot of respect uh, for Sylvia at the time, but Lenin did criticise her in left-wing communism and infantile disorder. He criticised her for not affiliating with the Labour Party, and he criticised her for her opposition to what she called parliamentarianism. Yeah. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Lenin's famous line is that um, social democrats should support the Labour Party uh, like the, the rope supports a hanging man. What Lenin recognised was that the majority of aspirational, progressive, working class people in Britain were gravitating towards the Labour Party. And if he wanted to address them, if he wanted to build the most effective revolutionary workers' movement, that's where you'd have to be in order to talk to them. And he was critical of Sylvia Pankhurst for staying out of that, for saying, no, I'm, I'm not going to go into it because the politics is reformist, the politics is corrupt, the politics is ultimately corrosive. And she was right on all those accounts. She was wrong in Lenin's point of view, to stay away from it. Because to stay out of it and to stay away from it was to stay away from where the working class were. Basically, the conversation was quite an interesting one. And Sylvia came back really quite pleased with what Lenin had said and convinced. And as a result, her organisation, which was the British Action of the Third International, affiliated to the Communist Party. So it was a storm in a teacup, really. Yes, she listened to the argument, was convinced, um, and she didn't stay in the Communist Party. She was expelled because she wouldn't give up the dreadnought. I'm here on Wapping High Street, an area once part of London's thriving docks. At the dock gates, Sylvia regularly organised meetings and spoke to dockers about the vital issues of the day. After the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, Britain and many other countries began shipping arms to Poland to arm the Bolsheviks' opponents and crush the Young Workers' Republic. Sylvia became a key organiser of the Hands Off Russia Committee and Councils of Action, both of which were set up from 1918 onwards to defend the fledgling Soviet state. In the Workers' Dreadnought, she produced articles lambasting British workers for collaborating with the murderous machine. In this edition, on May 8, 1920, she wrote, To British manhood, Comrades, how much longer will you be willing to fight, work and pay for the war which the British capitalists are making on the working people of other countries? In the following week's edition of the Dreadnought, we read of her relief that at last British workers were showing some basic solidarity. This is the story of the Jolly George, a very real event that has gone down in history, and this is what she wrote. Well done, London Dockers. British workers waking up at last. On Monday, May 10th, at 1pm, the shipping dockers in the East India Dock who were ordered to load the Jolly George, which was to carry munitions to Poland, struck work. They had only been working 20 minutes when they saw the guns coming down and declined to touch them. There can be no doubt that the refusal of Stepney dockers to load the Jolly George with arms for the White Army was a blow to the British government's attempts to crush the Russian Revolution. After this event, the British government changed their tack. There are some buildings here, I can see a couple that might have been here uh, when uh, the Jolly George was loading, probably very close to this. 
The world has changed here. We're now in a situation where people have no, no understanding of what is meant by sacrifice for international solidarity. There are a number of campaigns where people want people in the rest of the world to be victims. And that's good in the sense that they will give money. What was happening in the Jolly George campaign was that people were not only giving money by not working, they were effectively giving solidarity because they said, your struggle is our struggle. We want you to win, not because you are a victim and we want to give you some form of charity. We want to win because your struggle will help us in our struggle here. You could be cynical and say that the Jolly George incident, which people often talk about, is one of only a few examples of uh, internationalism in the British working class. And people often cite this and they also cite Lancashire cotton weavers refusing to touch cotton from the southern states in the American Civil War because they opposed slavery. And there aren't that many incidents, but you know, these things are symbolic and they also represent things which are bubbling underneath the surface. So that when dockers in Britain, like dockers in Bordeaux and like dockers in Italy, refuse to move goods and even troops that were being sent, in this case, uh, to the Polish front, it represents a huge step. You know, just think about it. They're saying, I prefer not to take any money rather than supporting my own country in a war of intervention against somewhere I've never been. Just think about it. That's a colossal step to take. And it really represents something which is a, a different mindset. It's the idea that their allegiance was potentially somewhere else. Not always, sometimes intermittently. Yeah? Ordinary life intervenes. But at a time when the world appeared to be changing really quickly, and in a way they thought it was changing positively, they said no. And interestingly enough, they won. Because British foreign policy, it may have been also for pragmatic reasons, was changed. The British government was so unconfident about its own position inside Britain. Let's remember this is in the aftermath of the First World War when everybody said, why did we fight for this? That they were forced to back down. They were forced to say, OK, we will recognise the Soviet Union. We will think about this and we will take notice of your uh, power. Sylvia clearly wanted revolutionary change, but revolution didn't happen. Why, why didn't it? Three words, the Labour Party. There is a whole tradition of scholars saying, oh, it's the British way. There never really was a bourgeois revolution. British history is disposed to gradual uh, evolutionary change. But I think that's projecting too much of what happened in the 1690s forward to the 1890s and the early part of the 20th century. There was no telling between 1910 and 1925 whether or not there might actually even be a, a British Revolution. And the thing that stopped it more than anything else was the Labour Party. I'm tempted to say also there's the question of race in particular, but that's got to be understood as a subsidiary aspect. Without the Labour Party as the mechanism for institutionalising racial thinking and the race question from a British establishment point of view into the British working class, there's no, no telling what could have happened on that question or on any other. My mother went on several tours one taking her to Hungary, another one taking her to the United States to popularise the message of the suffragettes. And her travels to the States took her not only from the white America to the black America, and this was much resented by, even by American suffragettes who felt that she shouldn't be mixing or having any contact with the so-called black population and she was much criticised, and she quotes examples of that in her book, because for her, the colour was insignificant. Her anti-imperialism, I think, runs to her very core. Anti-imperialism and anti-racism, the two things went together as far as she was concerned. You know she, that she employed the first black journalist ever, ever to have been employed on any newspaper in this country, a man called Claude Mackay. He was a Jamaican revolutionary. She was completely and utterly opposed to British imperialism in India. 
She was completely and utterly opposed to British imperialism in Ireland and supported the Easter Rising. But probably the most significant thing was that her anti-racism led her to quickly see the dangers of fascism long before most people did. I, I do find this a very unique aspect of her work. Mussolini came to power in 1922, which is much earlier than Hitler. A lot of people thought he was wonderful because they all called themselves socialists, you know, like Hitler did. I mean, Mussolini had been a, a member of the Socialist Party. A lot of people, including Bernard Shaw, um, thought Mussolini was a very good chap. Got Italy, which was always a troublesome country, organised and all the rest of it. Sylvia thought he, that Mussolini was a dreadful man, saw it straight away, and wrote some very good articles on fascism in the Dreadnought. She had been in Bologna in 1919 and had seen Mussolini's thugs fighting their way to power several years before Mussolini actually came to power as dictator. One of her least known fields of activity occurred in 1924 when the socialist member of the Italian parliament, Matteotti, was murdered on Mussolini's orders. She publicised the event. She got information that Matteotti's widow was being victimised, was not being allowed to leave the country. And she organised a women's, international women's Matteotti campaign, which had people like H.G. Wells. And she received information that a number of Italian anti-fascists were being imprisoned on the island of Lipari and they were without medical attention. The doctor asked her to provide medical attention. She raised money, she equip, bought, bought the equipment. I remember, as one of my childhood memories, seeing our dining room table with all these instruments, these surgical instruments. They were shipped to Italy with a, with a promise by the Italian embassy that they would be given to the surgeon, which they were not. They were in fact confiscated. But she did a lot to focus not only the question of Matteotti, but on the totalitarian fascist character of Mussolini's regime, and it had a lot of trade union support. Matteotti was uh, brutally murdered uh, by Italian fascists in uh, June 1924. The reason being was that he uh, launched a campaign against Mussolini's corruption of the Italian electoral process, um, particularly with a major speech in the Italian parliament two weeks before. And he was dragged from his car and uh, killed with a carpenter's file. His body wasn't found until August, uh, by which time there was already a political crisis in Italy. Uh, five people were arrested, three were tried. They were all found guilty but given an amnesty by the king. The significance, though, and I think this is very important, was that first, Matteotti was an anti-war socialist. He was a member of the most uh, internationalist section of the Italian Socialist Party. But after his death, the key response was, well, how, how do we cope with this? And there was no consistent opposition to Mussolini. He didn't take the form of uh, a consistent opposition inside Parliament or on the streets. And in the end, and this is nothing to do with the murder itself, by 1924, Mussolini had consolidated his position and Matteotti became a martyr rather than uh, the beginning of a fight back against Italian fascism. My father, Silvio Corio, was an Italian anarchist. In those days, you had more Marxism in Russia and anarchism in Italy. He became a refugee in England, a refugee from fascism. And he was very much concerned with making contact with the refugees who came from Italy, from Italy direct or from Spain who'd been in the Civil War and had escaped. My parents, like many socialists in those days, did not believe in the institution of marriage and did not get married. And of course, one has to bear in mind that European marriage in those days was much more tight and involved much more restriction and limitations of women's rights than it has now that divorce was much more difficult to obtain, that until recently, on marriage, the woman, the wife, 
lost her property to the husband. We were living in Woodford, which was an extension in a way of the East End. From the East End, you travelled out towards Epping Forest and she enjoyed very much being in Woodford and having the forest nearby. She lived mainly at two places in, in Woodford, the, the Red Cottage, which mm -hmm. she renamed from Vine Cottage, and she opened it as a cafe for lorry and bus drivers, much to the uh, consternation of the local residents. She also then moved to another place um, when she had her son, Richard, in 1927 at the age of 45, and that's where we've renamed the Green, Pankhurst Green because there was some disquiet on the council about renaming Pankhurst Green because some people on the council thought that um, the Pankhursts were controversial activists with only sectional interests and um, really didn't want to be any part of naming the Green. I mean, George Bernard Shaw called her either miraculous or unbearable <laughs> um, because she, and she wrote to generals and uh, statesmen telling them what they should be doing. MI5 had a file on her uh, which, which said how to muzzle the tiresome Miss Pankhurst. So um, she, she stirred things up and uh, as an unmarried woman with a, with a child, not born in wedlock, um, she was somebody who, who stood out. She wasn't prepared to conform as a lot of women in those days had to. She was arrested 15 times between 1913 and 1921 and, well, really believed in what she was doing. And I'm really glad that we've got in the museum here um, this uh, display about Sylvia and the fact that all her campaigns and what she stood for are mentioned. I think that's a real triumph for the people who wanted her to be recognised as um, someone who should be proud of having lived in our borough. Of course, in Woodford, where Sylvia spent so much of her life, there is this enormous statue of uh, Winston Churchill, with whom she was not on very good terms, to put it mildly. I'm the hottest man in town. To get to 1928 and the discussions, are we going to get this through or not? The, the cabinet's yes votes, it will put it through. And one dissenting voice is Chancellor Winston Churchill, who asked for it to be placed on record that he disagreed with this. And there's a little cabinet note that says that, and, um, where, which is quite interesting, I think. So this is the 1928 Act. The equal franchise means that um, they got the vote the same age as men, which was in those days 21 rather than 18 as we have today, for the, for the purpose of providing that the parliamentary franchise should be the same for men and women, both for general elections and for local elections as well. It was still a little bit controversial even by 1928. There was still a big discussion in Parliament over a couple of days. There were still some men who were willing to argue against this. As you can see in the Hansard debate, if I show you. Um, so this is uh, the House of Commons parliamentary debates from 1928. And you still get some uh, reactionary men saying things like, hitherto men have done all the heavy work in this country. Um, you have uh, women MPs by this point, of course, which you didn't have in 1918. So here you have Ellen Wilkinson objecting. Oh, really? Good gracious. Colonel Appling goes on. The Honourable Lady shakes her head. Let her reflect. Suppose that a woman sat on the bench of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Miss Wilkinson says, why not? Colonel Appling goes on. Imagine her introducing her budget and in the middle of her speech, a message coming in. Your child is dangerously ill. Come at once. I should like to know how much of that budget the House would get and what the figures would be like. You still have men uh, unafraid, should we say, to stand up in the House of Commons and make this sort of argument um, alongside uh, their women companions. What I found interesting was that the, the first um, woman who spoke in a debate in, in Parliament on, you know, that, that I came across, I think it was Lady Astor, actually opposed getting rid of the age limit on women's suffrage. Well, the, the same is true, I think, with the, the other women MPs who get elected in, in the next 10 years. They all ha they're all very conscious that they're, they're there as a Conservative or a Labour or a Liberal, and they have a party pro um, programme to fill, and they can't afford to be seen as flying women's flag all the time. Lady Astor started, I think, quite cautious in Parliament because she had to be, you know, and she was a Conservative. So and it takes time, um, not just among the women MPs, but sort of generally for people to think, OK, yes, we can bring that age limit down. It's not going to be the end of civilization as we know it. Yeah. She was not um, known as a, known for any part in the suffrage struggle. She was a very unlikely first woman MP in that regard. 
I think you're letting her off the hook slightly. <laughs> you have to think about where she was coming from. And what about Sylvia's attitude to Parliament in the end? Well, I think she was never very happy about Parliament, frankly, especially when her mother decided to stand as a Conservative MP for Whitechapel. She thought, this is mad. She began to devote her time to other things, really. I always think of your house in Woodford as being a, a hub of activity. Yes, but I suppose it started long before I was there to remember. The first refugees that I remember were three Italians, the most prominent of whom was Carlo Roselli, who um, organised the main resistance to Mussolini in Italy. Then again, a bit later on, there were the refugees from Spain, the Basques in particular, the Jewish refugees from Austria and Czechoslovakia. And then when you come to the colonial period, there was Kenyatta, who came many times from Kenya, in Biu Koinangi, who greatly impressed us all by his public speaking here, uh, even Nakuma. And she remembered when she met him, he asked, how is the village, referring to Woodford. The only physical sort of presence of Sylvia there now, since that, their house has been destroyed to make room for new development, um, the only presence of, that is reminiscent of her, apart from the new green, which bears her name, um, is the, uh, the anti-bomb bomb uh, monument. In response to imperial air warfare in Ethiopia, Burma and India in the 1930s, Sylvia Pankhurst commissioned the first ever anti-war memorial. Now known as the Stone Bomb, it was erected as a protest against war in the air on land owned by Sylvia Pankhurst when together with her partner Silvio Corio, she was living on the high road here in Woodford. It was unveiled in October 1935, the same month as Mussolini's assault on Ethiopia. It was accompanied by a plaque dedicating it ironically to politicians who, at the World Disarmament Conference in Geneva in February 1932, upheld the right to use bombing planes. The anti-war memorial was sculpted by a man named Eric Benfield. Recalling his monument, Benfield wrote, There was a strong pacifist flavour about the unveilings. It was anti-war, anti-bombing, pacifist or what you will. Yet I knew that there had not been one such urge in its first stirrings in my mind or in its execution. According to a dictionary, to pacify means to soothe, to calm, anything rather than to fight but I had no intention of soothing or calming anyone. It was my way to fight. As an internationalist, Sylvia Pankhurst would have concurred with Eric Benfield's thoughts. Her opposition to the First World War was not because she was a pacifist who did not believe in fighting. It was because she did not believe that workers from other nations should be slaughtered for the imperial advantage of ruling elites. Sylvia's internationalism meant siding with working class people across the world in opposition to your own state, an idea which, like the inscription on this monument, has sadly mostly faded away. As you move from the 1920s to the 30s, she saw that fascist Italy was planning an invasion of e Ethiopia, Abyssinia as many people called it, the only independent African country more or less on the continent. And at that time, she devoted her attention to writing letters to the press, holding meetings to oppose the invasion of Ethiopia. She made contact with people like Kwame Nkrumah, Kenyatta and others. And they formed an African Friends of Ethiopia society at the same time that she was involved in founding a society of friendship of, with Ethiopia and started her newspaper. Her newspaper was anti-colonialist in scope. It had frequent articles by African refugees, emigres in England, and nationalist leaders, Kenyatta and others. So that her newspaper, which had started as essentially an anti-fascist newspaper, became an anti-colonialist paper as the struggle went on. She took up the cause of Ethiopia in a very big way. And the reason she did that is because she reckoned 
that the white left would not be bothered about a black country. And she was quite right. They were all concerned about Spain, and not that she wasn't concerned about Spain, but she knew that Ethiopia would be a completely lost issue. So in 1935, she started a newspaper called The New Times and Ethiopian News. And it lasted for 20 years, and it's absolutely remarkable paper. I've read most of the, of the copies of it. and It had articles from most of the radical revolutionary leaders in Africa, people who were struggling for their country's independence. She n not only campaigned on Ethiopia, but really for the liberation of uh, all of Africa, which was, and this is where the anti-imperialism comes in, because most of it, most of Africa was ruled over by Britain and France in the main. When Mussolini entered the Second World War in June 1940, the question arose, would the British government recognise Ethiopian independence and establish the independence of Ethiopia, or will they continue to consider Ethiopia an Italian possession? And there was a lot of discussion on that. And as time went on, more and more British officials started to say Ethiopia is backward, it should become under British tutelage, it should become a British protectorate. This my mother was strongly opposed to, so that the newspaper which had been founded to defend Ethiopia against Italian fascism now became involved in a struggle to oppose British colonial attempts to partition the country, to establish a protectorate, to transfer Ethiopian territory to British colonies and so forth. So that it now became directed against Britain and so that the next stage of the paper's history was defending Ethiopia against its liberators, its so-called liberators. For that reason, the newspaper went on long after the end of the war in Europe. And as time went on, it became more and more concerned with trying to depict Ethiopia to the outside world. And, it's, and after the British withdrew from their occupation of Ogaden, which was in eastern Ethiopia, she felt that she could illustrate Ethiopia, reveal it, describe it to the outside world better by living there. And so she produced Ethiopia Observer, which she continued until her death in 1960, after which Rita and I continued it, but we continued it as a quarterly with the same idea to have each issue devoted to a particular subject so that it made possible investigation articles in depth. She later went to live in Ethiopia the last four years of her life and um, there were memorials set up to her in Ethiopia because she was a true friend of Ethiopia, a real good friend of black Africa, one of the very few white women who really understood what the issues were for black people. The tributes that came to her when she died were really pretty amazing. The only country that paid her no tribute at all was of course this one, Britain. <laughs>